Bashir gets his wardrobe at Tron. Cisco doesn't beg. And did Sorak say this is the most exciting episode he's ever seen? No. Hey, everybody. <laughs> oh, you did. Oh, <laughs> way to ruin the tease already. We're going to have to wait 45 minutes to find uh, out. Uh, Welcome to the seventh rule with Sorak Lofton. My name is Ryan T. Husk. And today we are reviewing season two, episode 11 of Deep Space Nine called Rivals, directed by David Livingston. How are you, Sirac? Doing good. Good. So, oh, David Livingston did this one, huh? Yeah. Cool. So second most exciting or third or what? Uh, no, no. It's not even the top five yet. Wow. So it's a good six. episode, but it's, it's, it's not exciting. <laughs> like that. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got to say, man, when it was pretty much over, yeah, last minute I was like, "Oh, oh, that that's it, huh? That's uh, no, no there real, well, you there mean, was no you real mean, climax. You, no, there wasn't a climax. There wasn't really a, a lesson there. I was, I, I kept thinking it was going to be something that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um, like <clears throat> this whole rivals thing I thought was something else you know I, I don't know it just kept going in a different direction each time I thought it was going in a direction it would turn another way and not in a good way in my opinion so <laughs> I'm sorry to say but no I like for example um him meeting the woman and wanting to marry her right away then he had the Dabu girl kind of you know on his side girl already but then he was also courting the the lady who it was taking all her life's fortune and investing in on the mining deal. Um, so there were so many little things thrown at me that I was like, okay, is this story about this, this person's interaction or no? Okay. So is it about this? No. The guy he meets in jail, for example, I thought, okay, there's a story here. That's about mm -hmm. this guy. They're going to be rivals, you know, and that's where it's going to go. And it didn't go there. So uh, everywhere I thought the story was going, it took, not necessarily for the for the good, like I say. Yeah, I think the rivals were these two guys we're looking at here, which was uh, Bashir, who shops at Tron. Right. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and Miles, who shops at, I don't know, Ross? Would you say that's Ross? That's a Ross look. <laughs> dress. Dress. For less, <laughs> dress <for less. laughs> it's, it's nothing futuristic about his look. That's know, the funny thing. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> like, right out of 1983, this guy. Yeah. You, you know what I was thinking? Complete opposites, yeah. Oh, by the way, those of you that are just listening in, uh, if you remember the episode Rivals, uh, Miles is in like a, a short sleeve sweater with a weird thing under it. You know, with a like collar a shirt, polo. that's a butterfly collar shirt. And then some khaki, khaki shorts and some nice little gray wristbands. And Bashir is wearing, I don't even know how I would describe that. Rock, do you want to give it a shot? No, I thought Tron was a very good. Uh, it actually looks one of like like a sis, like a Jake outfit. Yeah, a, J a Jake pajama. That's one of Jake's pajama outfits. But um, finally, finally, you got to see someone else wearing this stuff. <laughs> Somebody else got to wear it, which is great. And 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 O'Brien looks like Fletch. Um, <laughs> got the headband seen, too. <laughs> yeah, if you've ever seen Chevy Chase and Fletch. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's pretty accurate there. So no, I, I was uh, I was pleasantly disappointed for this whole episode. It was, it was <laughs> I I looked. I was also a fan of uh, Bashir's shoes. He seemed to have the like the silver the silver Nikes on. They uh, they were they were kind of they matched the outfit. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool too. I drew a picture of his shoes. Oh, let's um, see it. Oh yeah, well there it's a, it's a stupid cartoon vision, but it's it's I think his shoes are here somewhere, right? Oh there it is. You see his shoes there? This looks cool. The Star Trek the Star Trek Nikes. But no, I, I wasn't really I thought there would be more about, you know, luck and a storyline about how luck favors and which way and you know, some kind of really heavy hitting story, not the back and forth of it. And the, I guess the pulsating luck is on your side, luck is on his side moment kind of thing, but more like a, a lesson about luck or relying on luck 
you know, something to that nature. So I, I just, it was, it was just, it was okay. Um, you got to see the, the O'Brien uh, relationship develop, right? The, the, they're starting to bud their friendship, Bashir. Yeah. I, I like that too. I mean, it, you know, and they were rivals as well right. as Clark and the other guy, but we all know, you know, at some point they end up being buddy, buddy, but it was cute to see them all like fussy with each other and like, kind of yeah, I, I thought this was like the, the beginning of their budding friendship. That's going to kind of carry out. So I enjoyed that. Um, they kind of started here and, um, I thought, you know, some things were played like a little bit over the top for me, like when they were about to play the game for the first time and Bashir was doing all these weird stretching, uh, stretching scene motions, kind of a Richard Simmons workout type deal. And um, I was like, oh, uh, I, I don't know if I like this. Um, so th those were kind of over the top, an over the top moment for me. A little you bit. Know, there's a there's a very famous scene in the next generation in which uh deanna troy and beverly crusher are wearing the most atrocious uh outfits <laughs> to yeah. stretching and they're like stretching each other and and the camera's just like <laughs> right in on them and and you when you mentioned bashir doing that, i'm like man how does bashir's stretching an outfit compared to theirs i mean it, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not quite there but it's it's almost there it's comparable you know he he definitely yeah. wouldn't stick out with a with the, the other two he would definitely fit right in with their crazy outfits i don't know if you've seen it but i'll have to show it to you sometime. i have not seen it i have not seen it. i don't know that i'm missing out on much but i have not seen it that's pretty hardcore <laughs> but yeah that was i mean there were there were things in there uh <sighs> but yeah, that was the overall. It was it was not exactly the way I thought the storyline would go. It kept making these turns at various points. You know what I mean? Mm. And uh, you know, um, it was kind of like. Oh, by the way, I did like the line by Cisco when uh when Quark comes in and he's like hey you owe me one you know you yeah you, you begged me to stay here and he says he says i didn't beg you i blackmailed you and i'm like that's yeah. pretty good and he just like owns that. up to it he's like nah don't get it yeah. twisted man no nah. you know what i did <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i didn't beg you i blackmailed you i i like that line too um there were a bunch of lines that i wrote down which was funny because there were a bunch of lines that i did like in this episode hmm. um uh, even though I didn't necessarily like the episode, which is hilarious, but there were lines that I liked. And uh, one of them Odo came off with in the beginning when he, he says, you were talking, he was listening, you know? And I liked the way he's, he, he, he gave that line. Um, um, there was another one where uh, O'Brien looks over at Bashir and he says, oh, you think I'm stupid too? <laughs> <laughs> and I like that. I like that line. Um, and then there were some moments like the interchange between Rom and Quark that was pretty interesting, you know. Yeah. When, and then um, when uh, when uh, Rom says something to the effect of like the guys like uh, towards the end, the guys being a jerk. Yeah. So Rom's like, "Well, I quit." At, you know, at least over at Quark's, I can get ripped off by family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. I get cheated by family. It's better than getting cheated by somebody. I don't know. And the other line, I actually, the thing I was looking forward to the most in this episode was the scene of Rom asking for his job back. I thought that was like something they mm -hmm. could have, that would have been juicy material for me. I thought of that too. I thought, how does he know Quark's even going to take him back? What if Quark oh, says... Yeah. Oh, I, I hired somebody else, of course. What am I going to do? Just not replace you for a week? <laughs> He's, you know. Or no, no, I'll take you back. But now you're going to work at less money. So you just mm -hmm. actually, you just lost money, you know? So I was expecting them to do that. I, I was really waiting for that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, when he tries to drug or, or drug Dr. Bashir, you know, that was like such an obvious move. You know, the monks want you to drink this. Sure. Um, and then they put it in there just only to have him look into it. So it was, it was more of this exposure in the uh, episode 
I like the 47th rule of acquisition, which is never trust a man who's wearing a better suit than yours. Yeah, that was a good one. And there was a second one when, uh, which was hilarious. He says, dignity and an empty sack is worth a sack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rule of acquisition 109. Yeah, I love that one. I love that one. So like I said, there were so many lines in here that I actually liked the lines. Um, just it was the story itself wasn't really flushed out as well as it could have been. I thought there were more opportunities there that they could have taken advantage of mm. um, and establish more of, of it being about this rivalry between uh, Cork and the guy who was opening the place across from Cork. I didn't feel their rivalry as much. You know, he just popped up and opened a place, but it wasn't like they had this long-term rivalry that I felt as much as I felt it out of O'Brien and Bashir kind of having a rivalry about the the game. You know, I'm really uh, bummed out. I'm trying to find a good, a good picture of Troy and Crusher so that you could see it, but they're, they're all like low quality, but oh, okay. Um, anyway. I'll show it to you in a second here anyway. Is it, si is it similar to this outfit that uh, Bashir's got on? It's pretty bad. Um, here we go. I'm, I'll pull it up right now. Um, there we no go. No way. <laughs> they, they did this? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> and they're doing – there's all kinds of stuff where the – like, and they're bend, bending over in front of the mirror and everything. And man, it's there. There's worse ones, man. Like there. Yeah. I mean, anybody, every Star Trek person that's watched the next generation knows this episode. This scene is just pain. I mean, that's like the least bad thing that they did. Like they were, they were like holding legs together. <laughs> Like uh, okay. And yeah, and, and pulling each other backwards and forwards, and they're they're both doing this thing together, and yeah, and then there's like close ups, and it was just, it was no that, that especially the the leotard that wraps up under uh, is is really revealing. The <laughs> other thing is that it's probably this is the beginning of yoga, right? Kind of making it right its way yeah. into the the consciousness. So they probably say, oh, yeah, this yoga thing. Yeah, they're very... Uh, it looks like know. a play on it, but it's definitely <laughs> provocative. It's, it looks like uh, the Baywatch girls warming up for a run on the beach. Yeah, it's pretty... It's pretty bad. <laughs> but I, I, I know the guys were happy that day. Uh, I don't know, man. It's, even, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty revealing. Yeah, but it's also pretty... You know, it's raunchy. No, it's a little too. It's too no raunchy offense, for ladies, but the outfits are hideous. Okay, like that's not their fault, but like, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they're they're yeah, they're these they're the one piece bikinis, uh, basically outfits. Yeah, it's um, pretty tailor made over the top of these clothes. I mean, it's <laughs> it's a little bit. It's yeah, it's a little raunchy. It's it's, it's for late night. <laughs> It's for late night television, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. This is not for uh, family hour. And those of you that are listening in, half of and not watching the video, half of you are saying, "Oh man, I am so glad I'm not seeing the video right now because I know what that scene is." And the other half are going, "Oh man, I wish I could see that." Video. Yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious, but it's pretty bad. So yeah, um, so 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 Bashir looks like the yoga instructor for that scene. Is what you're saying. He looks like they'd be doing that for like three minutes. And then suddenly someone's at the door and it's Bashir. He's like, sorry, I'm late. Join <laughs> 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 in. Uh, like, yeah. right, so where were we? Okay, so we're all three pulling each other and, and stretching and Yeah, stretching it out. And he did that whole stretch routine where he was doing these he actually it, he, it looked like he was gonna do the nog dance. Mm. While he was stretching, he did one of these kinds of crossing his arms in an X uh, and then hand movements. So he almost did the, the full out Ferengi nog dance that he created. Um, we got to ask Sadig if, uh, if like they said, just make up any stretches. And so those were his invention or if they said, you know, just do the old crossbones maneuver, you know, that, that old. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that was choreographed. They flew in a guy, an expert stretcher from New Zealand. No, I, 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 <laughs> no, I have no idea. But it was definitely, uh, I, I wrote it down in my outfit because as soon as I, I'm in, on my notes, I, the first thing I wrote was, nice outfit, Sid. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then I wrote stretching it out, huh? <laughs> so, that's, the first, that's one of the first things I wrote. Where Where is it? Uh, I said, Julian's outfit. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a wow moment. You have to literally, it's the first, I mean, and it wasn't the first thing that came on screen, but it was the first thing that jumped out of my attention. That sure woke me up. And then the yeah. other thing I wrote was, was later on, I was like, okay, okay, seriously, guys. Next Star Trek convention we go to. Somebody's got a cosplay. Cosplay both of those guys. We need a Julian and Bashir pair where yeah. somebody's wearing the, the seven dollar dress for less outfit and the, the head person, the headband. Yeah. yeah and the other person's wearing the the uh the No, Brian has shorts on. Yeah, he has shorts, so he has these khaki shorts on. Yeah. Literally like he's just pulled right out of the eighties or the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> boy, oh boy, oh boy. And then Bashir is like out of like <laughs> he Tron. I mean, literally, like, where's where's your motorcycle at? <laughs> so we got how cool would that be though if we saw somebody cosplay? I don't think I've seen two people cosplay. Actually, maybe you and me should do it, Sirak. What do you we think? we could do it. We could do it, but you'd have to wear the Sid outfit. <laughs> I knew you. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I can't. I, All right, I don't think but then, I can be that sleek in that outfit anymore. Yeah, I don't know. If I wore that, I think I'd get points for you know the cosplay aspect, but I'd lose a lot of points because I'd be wearing that outfit. <laughs> you know, it looks like he's about to be shot out of a cannon. Uh, <laughs> yes, totally. You need just a little white hat. <laughs> yeah, that's that's all you need. Just climb into a cannon with that. Um, there was another line that I liked where O'Brien says, yeah, I just stumbled around the court for 90 minutes and made a complete ass of myself. It was the first time I heard a curse word kind of in an episode. Yeah. Right. So it stood out. I was like, did he say ass? Like, is that the first time, you know, that kind of language has been used in a Star Trek episode? Uh, in an episode. Yes. In the movies. No. Uh, yeah. There but, one, but on one television now. This yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe so. I think any time I've ever heard, you know, one or two bad words here or there, like they were all in the movies, uh, mm -hmm. most notably when, uh, what's his name, Data says, I, I believe I speak for everybody when I say to hell with our orders, that was one. And I believe there's a shit in there, here and there, but nothing too bad. That's nothing the first ass, I think. Yeah, I think it was the first ass. I wrote it down because it jumped out at me, as ass usually does. Ah, but tell us about like, that. You, <laughs> you like that one? No, um, it just jumped out at me because it was. It is television. It is you know, primetime television in most cases. So uh, that kind of language didn't really. I didn't realize was being implemented at that that early on. I thought that. You know, it came later towards the NYPD uh, undercover of our NYPD blue days, you know, when they started showing some sh ass, showing butt cheeks in episodes and cursing in episodes. So it was surprised. And the other thing that was surprising is that they let O'Brien get away with it if it wasn't, if he added it himself, you know what I mean? If it wasn't scripted and he said, yeah, I'm going to use this word. I'm sure that that would have been a problem. So if it was scripted, then it makes it even more kind of, wow, they put that in there. You know, uh, that brings up a, a good quick point. Um, what I've heard, uh, actually uh, a fellow by the name of Bill Moomy told this story. He was the original Will Robinson in Lost in Space back in the day. He was also in a Deep Space Nine episode, The Siege, I think the siege something in like the sixth or seventh season um he was also in a bunch of other stuff anyway um what he said was that when he was on star trek he was surprised that you could not add or take away one word like right. you know so 
So to, to your point, I'm pretty sure it was written in the script because if he was going to add one or two things, they'd be like, okay, well, we got to stop production and call the higher ups and we're going to have to wait for an hour and let them all talk about it and discuss it. Did you yeah. have any experiences like that? I did. I mean, I was there for those kinds of moments on the set yeah. when things were getting called up and I've also been around for, you know, the, the standard was to get everything word for word on a take and any variation or alteration would have to go through an approval. So after we would record a scene and the director liked it and wanted to print it, he'd have to ask the script supervisor if all the words were nailed. And sometimes there would be variation, right? And sometimes that variation caused a reshoot of the scene, and sometimes it did not. So sometimes mm -hmm. they'd say, oh, well, he said and instead of the or or, you know, and they would make a judgment call on the spot. Now, something was completely rewritten, and I've been there for these kinds of things where actors would say, no, I don't think he, I would say that. That doesn't make sense. Uh, I would say something else. Those kinds of things went by Ira, and they'd usually send guys down to the set to make a change, right? Yeah, and that's they, interesting. And they, they'd huddle and have a conversation. So it did stop production sometimes. Um, yeah. For example, um, you know, Avery was part of uh, changing the name of his wife on the show, uh, Penny Johnson's character, Cassidy. Oh, really? Yeah, and her name was originally written as something else, and I don't know exactly the name. But uh, she wasn't happy with it, and he seconded that opinion. And so he said, well, we, before we film, because once we start filming, then that becomes our name for That's canon. Eternity. That's it, yeah. Yeah. He said, before we start filming, we're going to have to come up with a different name. So bring Ira down here and let's figure it out. So I think they, they went through a process of getting a different name for her um, so while, cool. you know, while, while they're holding up production. So He went up to bat for her, man. He did. He went up to bat for her, and she made a valid point about the name. She didn't think it was as timeless as, as Star Trek likes to be represented. Mm. And it was a little bit too much, uh, too dated and too stereotyped. Love that. So uh, we got to go to a break right now, um, which is too bad. I kind of want to hear a little bit more about that, but I think we covered it. Also, when we come back on the other side, here's a little tease for you. How was Whoopi Goldberg connected to this episode? Star Trek nerds, Star Trek fans, Star Trek pundits. How is Whoopi Goldberg connected to this episode? And we will be right back. Sirak, I know you know the answer. I'm writing it down right now. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll be right back with the seventh rule. <laughs> <laughs> 